Uh, well, hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining this webinar. My name is Michael Wittersheim. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Library and Information Management at Emporia State University. Today's presentation and talk is part of SLIM's continuing education webinar series. Faculty in SLIM have been asked to discuss their current research interests in a webinar format in order to receive friendly and constructive feedback from peers. This webinar series is part of SLIM's initiative to offer optional and synchronous enrichment opportunities for our students in what is otherwise a fully online and fully asynchronous program delivery mode. In today's talk, I will discuss my research on what I call a nationwide bibliographic apparatus in the United States from 1876 to 1996. And this is a research topic that I stumbled upon. I completed my doctoral studies at the University of Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania. And as a doctoral student, I studied the history of the regional public library infrastructure in greater Pittsburgh. And as I developed this topic further, I came to know that the larger national context in the United States was essential to understand what was happening in Pittsburgh. I also teach LI 804, the Organization of Information. And this course, as I teach it, it has a historical focus. So this topic on the US bibliographic apparatus, it dovetails nicely with the content of 804. Parts of this, of this lecture have appeared in that course, and I hope to further integrate my research and my teaching in this way. Also, from my interactions with peers uh, in other institutions across the globe, I came to realize that what we have here in the US is distinctive from what I understand. Most other countries, such as those in Europe and Japan, have a centralized system with a strong socialized welfare state system. Needless to say, there is a stronger socialized and centralized orientation in other countries than what we have here in the US. So it might be easy to believe growing up here, working here in a US context that the US way is the natural in the normal way of doing things, but it actually is not. In the US, we have a federated system that emphasizes private sector investment and this general political orientation or philosophy or ideology, whatever you call it, um, it's truly distinctive and it reveals itself in the type of bibliographic system we use. Due to our federated political philosophy that's embedded in our constitution and permeates throughout our laws and agencies, we do not have what would typically be called a national bibliographic network, but we do have a nationwide one. This theme of a federated organization with strong private sector influence is one that recurs throughout the history of the US bibliographic apparatus. By bibliographic apparatus, I mean the systems, uh, the networks, the agencies, the standards, the policies, the laws, the funding, the technologies, all of these things that are used to facilitate the creation and sharing of bibliographic records. It is through these records that library resources can be located and shared across the country. One of the primary functions of the bibliographic uh, apparatus is to share these records in order to promote intellectual access to library collections. Now, the overarching question here is, how does the US do this? I like to divide things up into periods based on common themes. And here I have listed four tentative working periods in the history of the bibliographic apparatus. And these are what I call the standards age from 1876 to 1933, national planning from 1933 to 1956, the automation era from 1956 to 1996, and then we have the web age from 1997 onward. And these are working titles, they're working themes. Uh, at the end of this talk, I'm happy to hear if these divisions uh, ring true to you, or if you think I may be overlooking something that might uh, be important. Well, let's talk about the first period, the standards age. Um, the story of the nationwide information infrastructure in the US, it starts in the late 19th century. And as you know, the year 1876, it was a big year. Imagine the national library landscape at this time. The public library movement was taking off in the US. Cities and towns on the East Coast were just beginning to have their own municipal libraries by this time. Andrew Carnegie was just beginning to donate library buildings worldwide after 1900. 
the number of libraries is increasing. Colleges and universities had their own attached libraries, generally small by today's standards, but they were there nonetheless. Fiction lending was not something public libraries did much of yet. You'd still have to get your dime novel at the pharmacy. And as a patron, you probably couldn't access the stacks yet. You'd need to give uh, the book slip to the librarian who would, who would fetch it for you. So that's just some, some context. But the characteristic shared by libraries at this time was that independent libraries existed independently of one another. There were shared practices, yes, but there was not yet a uniform, consistent, standard way of organizing library collections. Importantly, standards for organization were just beginning to emerge. This is the defining char characteristic of this first era. And this is uh, what we might be called the golden era of bibliographic standards or the standards movement. And I define this era as lasting from 1876 to 1933. Standardization coincided with the larger progressive movement in the US and this movement championed economy, efficiency. Uh, we sometimes refer to this movement as, as Taylorism. Standardization within libraries fits very naturally within this intellectual and political era in the US more generally. What began to emerge were standards to use for organizing library collections. Um, and I mean, the overarching uh, you know, concern here was why go through the trouble to invent your own organizational scheme when someone could do it for you? Someone has already worked out the problems, made things easier for you. Wouldn't it just be easier if libraries all agreed to follow the same rules? Um, so some of the major uh, examples, the major bibliographic standards that were published and used during this time include the following cutters, rules for a dictionary catalog. This was originally published in 1876, reissued and used later on. LC published its own rules for the printed cards in 1899. ALA published catalog rules in 1908. Um, there were also more descriptive cataloging rules published by ALA and the LC leading up to AACR, Anglo-American Cataloging Rules. LC began publishing LCSH, the Library of Congress subject headings in 1909. Sears subject headings were first published in 1923. The first class of the Library of Congress classification, LCC, and the class was Z. This was first published in 1902. And those, um, each of those different uh, categories were published separately, uh, you know, outsourced to different experts in the field, and then later assembled together throughout the 20th century. DDC, the Dewey Decimal Classification, this was first published also in 1876, coinciding with Cutter's own rules. And this was also, as you know, revised, republished continuously thereafter. We still that use that today as we do most of uh, these other ones. LC's card distribution service was announced in 1901, implemented in 1902. Subscriptions rose from 212 in 1902 uh, to 1,986 by 1914, and then to 6,311 by 1938. And just imagine all of these libraries that are subscribing to the Library of Congress's card distribution services, they're all um, adhering to these standards that, the, that LC has um, promulgated. So, but in addition to these relatively known um, national agencies, um, as well as the, the professional organizations like ALA, publishers and other independent card manufacturers were also distributing their own catalog cards to subscribing libraries. So with all of these services, libraries had fewer catalog cards to create themselves for any new item, any new book that they acquired. During the standards era, the four main categories of players on the national stage were one, individual library leaders, people like Cutter, Dewey, Sears, people who publish their own standards, right? Uh, the second category of people was LC. LC uh, became the authority of authorities, the, the national gold standard keeper of authorized lists. Uh, and they also began their own card distribution service. Then thirdly, there was ALA, the professional organization. Uh, they also produced their own bibliographic standards. And finally, there were the private companies like publishers, vendors who published and distributed standards and also distributed their own um, catalog cards. So as I said at the outset, there is this state-led leadership from agencies like LC, but there's also the private, in most cases, commercial innovation from individuals like Cutter and private agent, uh, organizations like ALA. Uh, moving on, uh, as we saw, there was a, a clear and deliberate adoption of library standards in the first era. 
but con conspicuously absent from this picture at the start of the 20th century was any federal government involvement in libraries. Uh, there was no national library plan, no vision for how a library service should be coordinated nationally. Professional library leaders, notably those in the ALA, they began to court the idea of national planning. And this is what the, this next era of development is all about, federal government involvement. This leads to the second chapter of the story, which is what I uh, call the era of national planning. The years of this second era are from 1933 to 1956. ALA issued its first set of national standards in 1933. This was a milestone year. These standards were to serve as guidelines for public library development across the country. They related to staff training, size, governance, collection size, and minimum funding. And subsequent standards were published by ALA in 1943. ALA's Library Bill of Rights was first published in 1939 in light of developments abroad and at home. And just for example, that year, there were calls uh, for librarians to censor uh, Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath. The first national plan for libraries was published by ALA in 1935, then again in 1939. Then there was another milestone year, 1937. This year, the Library Service Division was established in the US Office of Education. And this happened because ALA leaders were, were close to Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal administration and his National Planning Board. A number of federal agencies would be consolidated into Roosevelt's Federal Security Agency in 1939. The Library Service Division moved there until 1953, when the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare was formed, and then it moved there. Before 1937, there was no federal office responsible for library planning. LC was only the keeper of standards. It never functioned as a planning agency. So let's just pause for a moment just to consider how odd this is compared to the rest of the world. Almost anywhere else in any other nation, there is a national library, there's a national ministry, um, one or the other oversees library development and library policy, not just standards, but development. The development and planning responsibilities are centralized. Uh, but that was never the case in the US and is still not the case here. That is why I use the term nationwide information infrastructure, not national infrastructure. Um, we, the U.S. just does not have a centralized national agency that is responsible for library development in, in, um, in such a way. So initially, the Library Service Division was tasked with coordinating library service at the national level. From 1946 through 1951, um, there was what was called the Public Library Inquiry. This was a, a huge event in the library world. It resulted in 12 books and reports about public library use across the country, one main finding of the study was basically that libraries are not as widely used as librarians make them out to be. Most people don't use libraries. And the inquiry revealed this disconnect between myth and reality. But um, you know, as moralizing, as, as demoralizing as the public library inquiry was for the library profession, it did help to spur on the movement for federal library aid. Public libraries were, were um, funded through local support and the support of private foundations. ALA proposed the idea of federal funding as early as 1919, and it was raised again in 1929, then in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Um, federal aid did come in the form of the Federal Relief Act and the Works Progress Administration uh, during the Great Depression, but there wasn't dedicated funding, um, and the idea was really controversial. Not all members of ALA wanted federal funding and some thought it would come with unwanted strings attached. But in 1956, the Library Service Act was passed by Congress and signed into law by President Eisenhower. And there were other later funding bills like the National Defense Education Act of 1958, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965, but LSA from 1956, that was the big one. And um, keep in mind, this is all during the Cold War, the space race, Sputnik was launched in 1957. Libraries were said to be part of America's intellectual arsenal against the Soviets. LSA would be expanded into the Library Services and Construction Act, LSCA, in 1964, and then expanded again in 1966. And so by the close of this era, we have the formative bibliographic standards that would continue to be revised and adopted by libraries nationwide. We also now have federal funding 
that would be used in part to support the growth of a bibliographic infrastructure, but we don't yet have the technological means for an infrastructure to develop nationally. And that, inf that, that technology would come next. All right. So the previous period that we just discussed, national planning, this was characterized by how the federal government took on its first roles in library development. There uh, was also an emphasis by the new federal office in the National Professional Organization, ALA, to develop a coherent national vision for libraries. The next period following this, what I call the age of automation, it's characterized by technological change. But before we get into that, I'd like to highlight how different this period is from the previous one in terms of, of leadership. So as we said, 1956 was a huge year, LSA passed. At first, these federal grants funded bookmobile services and state library staff. Later, when LSA was expanded to LSCA, and when LSCA was further expanded, even more money went to libraries, including library facilities. And this funding continued through the rest of the century up until 1996. And at that time, um, it certainly seemed like after 1956, there was going to be much more federal intervention in library operations. And like we said before, 1937 was also a huge year because libraries got their first government office. Again, the office was charged with charting a path forward for libraries nationally. It appeared there would be some new vision on the horizon. But in all of this, there was a problem. The Library Service Division was charged with fostering nationwide coordination of libraries. Except when LSA passed in 1956, the division's main purpose became allocating and overseeing that spending. The office therefore lost its original task of national leadership and national planning, and it went from a leadership office to a managerial one. Other factors complicated the purpose of this office. Anyone who deals in government documents knows that federal agencies move around, and this library service division was in the Office of Education. But the Office of Education moved around within the federal government. It was in the Department of the Interior from 1870 to 1939. It then moved to the Federal Security Agency until 1953. Then it transferred again to the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. Welfare. And this was until 1979 when the Department of Education became its own department. So the Library Service Division was referred to as various names throughout this time. Whatever it was called, it stayed yoked to the Education Office until 1996. And then in 1997, there was this newly formed Institute for Museum and Library Services, IMLS, and that still exists today. But what, the, what all this indicates is um, you have this library office. It's not very powerful. It's kind of hidden within the Office of Education. It's constantly being jostled around within the executive branch. And how can an agency such as this provide consistent national leadership? Is there space to develop a national plan when there doesn't appear to be a plan for the office itself? So what further complicates this is, what's more, um, the library office oversaw LSA and LCA funding. There were other funding laws that affected libraries but were not overseen by that office. There was the ESEA, the Higher Education Act, the Higher Education Facilities Act, for example. If the library office did not control all the funding, how could it direct libraries nationally? With this mass of funding sources, it was impossible for any single office to direct libraries towards some national plan. And the big idea here is that the Library Service Division failed in its leadership role. This is the one component of a library leadership vacuum that was opened up after 1956, and this leadership vacuum was further opened up by failures by ALA. And as you recall, part of ALA's leadership role consisted of issuing professional standards. For a time, though, it also took on the role of issuing national planning documents. After 1956, ALA shifted completely away from issuing national planning documents and it focused exclusively on continuing to develop professional standards for the various aspects of librarianship. And uh, what this meant was ALA did not promote a shared vision of libraries on a national scale. Then in the 1970s, ALA issued planning documents that focused on individual libraries planning processes, like creating a, a mission statement, doing strategic planning. These were not national planning documents, but guidelines that library administrators could consult when carrying out their own planning processes. The big idea here was that ALA also shifted away from national planning, thus contributing to a leadership vacuum. 
One other, one other indication that the era of national planning had failed was that the ILL system was broken. Um, by the late 1960s and 1970s, ALA proposed ILL, ILL codes were no longer equipped to enable libraries to share resources adequately. ILL is, a, as you know, a fundamental function that has to work well in anything that can be called a national bibliographic network. But even this basic service was problematic. So that was kind of an aside, but it sets us up for what's coming next. This leads us to the technological changes that characterize this new era, the era of automation. There are a number of new players that came on the scene after 1956. These players promoted the use of computers in library operations and the use of computers to perform library tasks and the connection of libraries using computers and telecommunication, telecommunications equipment. This is generally referred to as automation. It's important to note that automation is not just a change in technology. It's also an ideology. It's a philosophy and an outlook that emphasizes computers. The first new player was CLR, the Council of, on Library Resources. CLEAR was a major funder of automation projects, anything to do with libraries and computers. It was funded by the Ford Foundation. Notably, CLR founders did not invite ALA to their formative meetings because they did not believe ALA leaders were quote unquote visionary enough. Another big player after 1956 was the National Commission on Libraries and Information Science, NICLAS. This was formed in 1970 as an independent federal agency within the executive branch. And so basically the commission was charged with studying library problems, promoting research, research developing a, a national plan and advising the president and Congress. In 1974, there was talk by Nicholas of a national library network with centralized bibliographic services led by LC. Clear's vision of the national network was more federated. So you have these kind of similar but competing ideas from these two um, new actors on the national scene, Nicholas and Clear. Both visions required the gradual construction of a national bibliographic database with bibliographic records and holdings information. This would be to facilitate cooperative cataloging and ILL exchanges. To understand how automated library networks grew, it's necessary to understand the history of computers to some degree. The earliest computers were mainframes. Mainframes were operated in a star structure with a central computer at the center and command terminals on the periphery. Libraries did not have fully functioning quote unquote smart computer terminals at that time as they do now. Terminals were quote unquote dumb in the sense that they could only communicate with the mainframe, but they had little functionality other than that. Uh, processors were too expensive for them to be everywhere as they are now and microprocessors had not yet been developed. So information, also the information storage medium early on was either punch paper tape or uh, magnetic tape. So this early computer um, technology um, you know, stage, it, uh, it facilitated the creation of two types of networks nationwide, information networks. These are the online search services, that's number one, and also number two, bibliographic utilities. Online search services in the 1970s and 80s, these included such things as the National Library of Medicine, the New York Times, uh, what was called SDC System Development Corporation, uh, Lockheed Dialogue, which uh, I think you've probably heard of, also bibliographic retrieval services. Libraries used online search services to identify journal articles that were relevant to some particular question or topic. Each service had its own database or a set of databases of bibliographic records. And using a terminal, librarians could dial in and search the database by field. They would have to construct a search string using the correct syntax, the correct controlled vocabulary. And once that command was input and sent, it would take some time to retrieve the results. There would likely be a printout of results. And then because the service did not provide the articles themselves, only the information on where to find them, the librarian would then have to go look to see you know, which libraries had those articles, send in requests to borrow them through the mail or, or what have you. Some vendors' central computers only operated on certain days during limit, limited time windows, so library searchers had to plan their searches accordingly. Um, I mean, just take a moment to compare that experience to what you do today when you're searching through a database on a library website. Um, 
So some things maybe have changed, other things have not changed. But anyway, here is a picture. This is what um, the Atomic Energy Commission's database, the, they, uh, NASA's recon software, their terminals look like this. They're a, they look like a teletypewriter. They have a cathode ray tube to display the, for the monitor. They have the keyboard attached. And this is used to communicate with their mainframe in order to retrieve records. Um, this is a, a picture of an analyst conducting a Medline search at the National Library of Medicine in 1975. Um, the results of this search might be displayed on the terminal, but they're more often printed out on a serial typewriter printer. And the turnaround time varied, but from the late 1960s to the late 1970s, wait time was gradually reduced from months to weeks to days and to seconds. And this is an image of the National Online Search Service Network in 1980. You can see some of the major online search services around the country, um, some of the major vendors like the Lockheed Dialogue, New York Times, National Library of Medicine. But in addition to these online search service networks that came into existence, there were also the bibliographic utility networks. And uh, that's a main um, component of, of this apparatus that we're talking about today. So like the online search services, the bibliographic utilities, they also use mainframe computers to create centralized databases of bibliographic records. And just as within online search services, libraries access the centralized databases of bibliographic utilities using remote, online and dedicated terminals. Unlike the online search services, however, bibliographic utilities were not used so much for information retrieval, but they were used for cataloging purposes. The pool of cataloging uh, records maintained by the utilities, they were used by the libraries primarily to print out their own catalog cards. The card catalog with its author, title, subject indexes, with each record consisting of a paper index card, this was still the dominant cataloging tool used in libraries. And most libraries did not yet possess computers themselves. They could only pay to access mainframes remotely. Bibliographic utilities were labor and cost-saving devices. Uh, they were cost-saving services. Instead of catalogers creating new original cards for any new items um, the library added to its collection, the catalogers could instead pool already existing records by accessing its uh, bibliographic utility. If a record for an item did not yet exist, the cataloger could create one, thus adding to the database for others to use. The bibliographic utilities form the basis of a shared, cooperative, online cataloging network among libraries. By 1980, there were four major bibliographic utilities in North America. The oldest and the most dominant utility was Ohio College Library Center, which is now known as OCLC. This was located outside of Columbus, Ohio, it began as a way to automate the bibliographic services of colleges and universities within Ohio. In the 1970s, OCLC's service area expanded to include member libraries outside the state. By 1980 and 1981, coinciding with its relocation of its headquarters to Dublin, Ohio, the acronym OCLC came to stand for Online Computer Library Center to reflect the organization's international scope and its increasingly online services. Other centralized bibliographic utility networks in 1980, besides OCLC, were the University of Toronto Library Automation System, Washington Library Network, and Research Libraries Information Network. This is a map of uh, some of those, the non-OCLC networks, and you can see where those are, are located throughout the country. Um, this is an OCLC model 105 terminal from 1979. This is what that would have looked like searching for a catalog record, creating a catalog record. Um, this is a uh, Washington Library Network terminal 1979. And these are examples of what the catalog cards, which would have been pulled from OCLC or the Washington Library Network, what they would have looked like when they were printed out. Uh, these cards were sent by mail from the utility to the library, or uh, they could be printed out by the libraries themselves. But printing out these cards, this was the whole purpose uh, for libraries to use the bibliographic utilities. But these bibliographic utilities, these were possible because of the shared network standards. The primary standard was MARC, Machine Readable Cataloging. 
bibli bibliographic utilities were possible because LC distributed its MARC tapes for free. These were punch paper tapes with bibliographic data on them encoded in MARC standard. LC began to develop MARC in 1965, and they began to distribute MARC tapes in March of 1969. MARC was used to store and distribute bibliographic data that was displayed on the index cards used in card catalogs. MARC data was read, displayed, and printed by machines. The distribution of MARC records began to overlap with LC's card distribution service in 1968. The card division began to automate by storing card information on optical disk and punch tape. By 1980, LC was no longer the principal source of printed catalog cards. The primary distributor of bibliographic data became the bibliographic utilities, such as OCLC. At LC, catalog card distribution continued, but in 1975, the card division became the cataloging distribution service. Given how LC distributed not only paper cards, but also marked tapes, book catalogs, and cataloging manuals. And I'd like to share with you a quote from LC from 1980. I think, believe this is from their one of their annual reports from 1980. It really sums up the changing state of affairs. It says, quote, sales trends, growth strategies, and new product development during 1979 reflected the changing role of the Library of Congress in the bibliographic services marketplace over the past decade. Before the advent of MARC in 1968, LC's primary role in the distribution of LC cataloging was to disseminate data in card and book form to a large diversified library market. Through the cataloging and distribution service, the library continues to distribute cataloging and authority control data in a variety of forms to meet the needs of different types of libraries. Today, however, there is less dependence on the Library of Congress as the sole source of this data. Distribution of LC cataloging in machine readable form has made it possible for bibliographic utilities and the commercial sector to assume an increasingly important role in the secondary distribution and repackaging of LC bibliographic data for the nation's libraries, end quote. So to sum this up, basic, this is a turning point in the, the nature of the apparatus. LC was a catalyst for the commercial sector, which then took over the distribution of bibliographic information. Um, now, in addition to the online search services that we discussed and the bibliographic utilities and LC, there's another layer to this national, this nationwide bibliographic network, and that is the regional networks that served as brokers for OCLC, and they provided regional services. This is a map of the U.S. All of the OCLC um, uh, friendly um, brokers uh, across the US that would facilitate a more of a, a local and regional network still using OCLC uh, resources. Now, uh, there was an extended moment in the 1970s when briefly it was thought that a national library network centrally administered by LC would emerge. The NCLIS planning documents from 1974, 1975, 1978, they called for this type of centralized um, network administered by LC. But in reality, it never happened. 1980 came and went. OCLC remained the dominant bibliographic utility. And I argue what happened was distinctively American. LC instead, instead of taking on the leadership role, it, it led from behind the scenes. It encouraged private investment. It did not replace OCLC. In other words, it, it, it led, but it did not manage the network. It kept its role as keeper of standards, and it didn't move beyond that role. And basically, this is still where, where we are today. OCLC is the de facto nationwide bibliographic network in the US. LC provides guidance, but doesn't interfere with it. Libraries use WorldCat, Iliad for pooling and sharing records. Um, libraries also use their own consortium, state, and regional networks. These are all using uh, shared standards, some of them developed by OCLC, but there is no national network, I argue. So coming to the end of the age of automation, computers got smaller, they got more affordable, 
mainframes became mini computers, which became microcomputers. Microcomputers look like terminals and were the same size, but what distinguishes a microcomputer from a terminal is that it possesses a microprocessor. And the microprocessor gives the microcomputer, what we call today just a desktop personal computer, it gives it its own computing power and thereby transforming it into a workstation, allowing it to perf perform its own operations, run its own programs. Eventually, libraries got their own microcomputers. But again, all of this automation was dictated by the commercial sector. And by the end of the 1980s, libraries began to use what we know now as integrated library systems, ILSs. These included cataloging and circulation modules. With libraries using computing systems of their own, there was a shift away from a single national library network um, and uh, a concentration by libraries instead on forming their own local and regional networks. The age of automation ends when this nationwide bibliographic network intersects with another contemporaneous development, the internet. The internet was a totally separate project from this national library network that I've discussed thus far. But in the early 1990s, libraries began to connect to the internet. 1994 is considered the dawn of the World Wide Web, and there were graphic user interfaces, browsers, 1995, uh, OCLC provided access to its services via the internet using microcomputers with a graphic user interface and web browsers such as uh, Netscape and Microsoft Explorer. So the age of automation, according to my own def def uh, definition, it ends in 1996 with the passage of the Library Services and Technology Act, LSTA. This act established the Institute of Museum and Library Services. It also funded the development of electronic network infrastructures in public libraries. The Federal Telecommunications Act of 1996 mandated that private internet service providers offer reduced rates to public sec sector institutions like schools and libraries so that they could connect to the internet affordably. So that brings us to the latest period, the one we're in currently, which is what I call the web age. And um, I don't have this period uh, as fully filled in as the other periods. Uh, my future work will uh, unravel this, whether this is uh, an appropriate title for this period, if it, it, it is actually distinguishable from the previous one, what is it that distinguishes this? But some characteristics of this period that uh, come to my mind, um, this new web era, um, I mean, is it characterized, it's characterized, of course, by web content, this explosion of web content, the World Wide Web, but we also knew have, have new ways of searching this content content, web search engines, things that didn't exist previously. There are uh, more digital collections, digital resources like ebooks and e-journals. There's this instantaneous access to resources um, in a way that hasn't been seen in earlier periods. And given all these changes, uh, I guess some of the questions that come to my mind are, what does this mean for the organization of information? What's changing here? Uh, what does this mean for standards and authorities? Um, are there parallels with other periods in terms of the web's governance and structure? And I mean that relationship between the public sector and the private sector. I think there might be some, some parallels there. Um, some other things to consider are uh, data surveillance. Um, so I, I hope to develop this, uh, the narrative for this period further uh, moving forward. But I'd like to conclude by inviting any questions and, and comments about this topic. Uh, I hope to fill out this historical narrative by further detailing the development of bibliographic standards in some of the later eras, uh, placing this narrative of standards alongside what I already have here to, to see what happens if, if there's a, a new story that emerges or if the existing story I have uh, holds true. I've also considered restructuring my 804 course using this narrative as a guide. And I, um, I'm, I'm wondering, I'm kind of imagining, what would it be like to make 804 a full-on history-based course? What would that look like? Uh, I'll just also say for any students watching this presentation, uh, I'll just point out that SLIM offers LI-865 independent study. Uh, and I believe this course can be taken as one, two, or three credit hours. So if you are a student who's interested in researching this or another topic, please reach out. So thank you for your attention.
have a question for you, Michael, if you have a minute. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm interested in um, kind of a more uh, kind of a behind the scenes view, if you'll, if you will, of how you went about conducting this research. I'd love to hear maybe the bird's eye view of what went into it. Some it sounded like you read a lot of organizational reports and things like that, but if you might give us a sense of what went into developing this timeline and the details that you shared with us today. Sure. Yeah, great question. Um, some of the earlier stuff from the standards era I had already put together for 804. I focus a lot on the early standards development at LC, uh, Dewey, Cutter. Um, so I had some of that put together just from researching that course. The later standards were really, I had to dig in kind of um, uh, just fresh. And uh, the national planning, there have been some other secondary books written already on that by there's an author Kat, Kathleen Maltz who uh, is a library historian I think she was at Columbia for a time and she also worked in one of the federal offices so she had a great perspective on the national planning perspective there have been some other um, of course there's been research on the public library inquiry that occurred during that time there's been a lot documented about the lead up to the LSA LCA funding and that movement um, then when we get into the age of automation, um, it's uh, more from some of the the, um, the professional journals and reports. Um, people seemed, um, they're always studying what is the new technological development of, of the moment. Um, looking at that in some of the journals, looking at uh, these uh, reports issued by these agencies like NCLIS, CLR, LC, those were uh, really what I followed. Um, these, um, you know, planning documents, uh, reports, things like that. Those were my sources. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. Great, this is kind of, you know, I, I, I'm fascinated with the uh, kind of, historical context for each kind of um, shift or kind of changes in the era. Uh, but you mentioned that the, the American system, probably the unique, the most unique system, not on the kind of federal level thing, but I'm kind of wondering uh, other kind of countries system is really federal or uh, how can I say, it's really uh, facilitating the network of libraries of books. Uh, for example, I mean, I can quick search, you know, British Library is actually established in 1970s. So, you know, it, at, at the national uh, level as a, you know, uh, branch of the, gov the you know, government or, you know, Japan's dietary library is actually post-war uh, thing. Um, and, you know, the Japan is very controlled the culture itself. So uh, is it uh, really from our kind of perspective, you know, focus on the materials and then how can you, uh, you know, uh, manage for the for the purpose of the uh, dissemination and you know access. So, do you have any kind of further uh, thoughts on that that part? Yeah, um, I you know I hesitate to actually act like I'm an expert on other country systems because I'm not, but I know just from interacting with uh, my peers from places in Northern Europe, say like uh, Norway, Sweden, Denmark. Um, you know, my colleague in Japan, uh, from what I did, from what I know about other places in Europe, Central Europe, uh, it's a centralized system. There's, um, you know, the top-down administration of standards and planning. Um, it's a different political philosophy, a different political system. And uh, I don't see as much uh, private influence there. Uh, be, they have a, more of a, uh, a socialized um, orientation um, with uh, you know centralized administra administrative control, and so this theme that I saw in the U.S., where and it, it was especially I think evident during COVID, each state has its own 
way of of doing things um and uh there there's this um reliance on the private sector to handle things to, to for the the state to take a hands-off role to um to uh you know like support but not push a certain direction to let the market you know run things that type of thinking uh came out in this especially in the discussions in the 1970s when nclis and clr were kind of debating well what should this centralized what should what should this network look like uh there are these competing visions and um you know it was striking to me that this in what we we, we can only call a privatized network was is what was resulted it was just really surprising to me i guess because people you know you go to a conference somewhere you know, I went to a conference in like Iceland, people are asking me like, what is, what is the US's national uh, library network look like? It's very hard to describe. Like, what do you say? Oh, yeah, we have OCLC run things. They're like, what do you mean? Like, you're just leaving it to this private entity? Like, what if they decide to do something that people don't want? You know, how do you govern that? And how do you, who, who funds that exactly? What if, you know, it's it just, um, but I, your your question makes me really want to understand other the other nations' um, systems differently to really make sure that I'm understanding them right and that uh, you know I'm not like overstating my argument about the uniqueness of the U.S. Like maybe there is something that's similar in other countries. Yeah. So okay, again, the, the the U.S. is a very unique. For example, education is not a federal thing at all. I mean, yeah. you, you just mentioned in in your presentation like uh, the separate entities, 90s or 70s, right? As at the Department mm -hmm. of Education, that that's probably a big surprise to everybody outside the US. Right. You know, you know the Department yeah. of Education is not a part of your government, you know, in for a exactly. long time. So mm -hmm. that that you know that tells you know whole story, you know, what is what is the role of state or role, role of the federal government. So uh, and then it it comes down to every single thing, including library. So, um, and you know, so now I understand the what where the army goes from. You know, the, yeah, yes, <laughs> the services yep. that they overcharge everything. You know, you know, like a webinars they charge like a, you know hundred dollar per session, <laughs> fifty minute session. So, <laughs> okay, good. Uh, thank you for your comment, Stan. Um, yep. uh, the All Russian Institute for Scientific and Technical Information. Was this? Can you give us a, like a time frame? Was this? Um, is this still in existence, or did it? I mean, the Soviet Union is not, but I mean, is this the centralized ministry? No, it's not actually in existence. So it broke down with the dismemberment of the Soviet Union, but essentially it was a state control agency like everything else in the country. And uh, the idea was to control the production and management of scientific and technical information and particularly protect uh, the exposure of this information uh, to, the, to the West so to speak, and it flourished in the age of space race and the Sputnik and the uh, the nuclear bomb development. So it was very much uh, an analog to the to our cataloging and classification system, except that uh, its impact was much wider because they controlled uh, not only how information was uh, cataloged and organized, but uh, what was produced and the tone of that information. So they, it sounds like they had um, an all-encompassing role. I mean, the standards, the distribution, the preservation, the... Um... Correct. Is that accurate? Okay. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's a, yes. that, it seems like that's, I mean, it seems like an extreme case maybe, but kind of what I'm picturing on, um, in most of the rest of the world, there is this some type of centralized uh, state agency that decides things like this. Yeah, uh, 
And the surprising thing to me when I did some research on this was that uh, when some interaction was possible between uh, the Soviet and the US information professionals, what they found was how much in common they actually had in their approaches and the goals they pursued, the, the underlining goals that uh, that were behind all this work, which was at the end of the day, access to information. What I'm trying to say is that political agenda was one thing and the competition in the space race was one thing, but uh, the day-to-day -day work uh, produced another picture altogether. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, yeah, for sure. Libraries in the U.S. were certainly, you know, part of the, you know, defense agenda. I mean, a lot of money flowed to libraries during, um, you know, space race and the Cold War. Um, it was really, they were really politicized. Uh, the school libraries especially had a lot of funding during that time. Um, but, yeah, so this is, I mean, this is a, a project I, Kind of just encountered during my work on uh, you know the book project on Pittsburgh and 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 struggling to understand what was happening nationwide, knowing that context really helped me understand what was happening in Pittsburgh. And it it's funny how it really it dovetailed with what I was already doing in eight oh four, which is trying trying to tell trying to guide the course using a a historical narrative for for students to see. That there was this development of standards um, based on technologies, uh, based on you know the the politics of the moment, um, you know based on reading habits and and things like that, culture. Um, so what I I need to do more of is uh, kind of hold these two timelines side by side with the the standards, bibliographic standards, kind of what we're studying in eight hundred four with this other. Uh, infrastructural history to see what kind of things pop out, and uh, if if looking at the standards side by side reveals something new. I, and I have not, I've not done that. But um, yeah, you know, like I said, if there are students watching, if if you'd like to work on this, if this is something interesting to you, um, you know, definitely reach out. I have just a quick question: Do yeah. you actually show the actual? mark record to students in your 804 the actual file is a one uh, single string <laughs> you know? right yeah uh you know it's it's kind of what a staff view looks like for a library it's not on the single string like it would would have been on the paper tape but that's i do ask them to imagine it that way with those indicators yeah, in yeah. the fields that's that's how you would have to all the kind it of, has end, to be of end of field end of record you know that that indicators all you know i was shocked to, to see that actual file right wow, you know yeah well one of the things i think that it blows people's minds is how it had to be read linearly it was on a piece of tape and so that's everything we did in libraries for decades is based on that uh storage medium and now trying to transition over to the semantic web XML, you you can a, a database, basically a database structure of information instead of this linear format. Yep. It changes how you can manipulate the data, um, and I think we're. I try to get across at least. I don't know if people get it, but it's you know we're still struggling to um, you know break from this uh, lineage that uh, has kind of held us back in in the standards world to this new way of organizing things. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for, for coming and great questions. It was a pleasure to be here.